So here's how I was thinking about you this morning. At about five o'clock, outside my window, this is the first year that this has happened, there were seagulls. But really going at it. And because it's spring, which is my favorite time of the year because there are bird songs, I couldn't hear the other bird that usually comes at five o'clock in the morning. I don't know what it is, but it's a bird that has, I would say, maybe five or six notes in its song, but different octaves. So two, maybe two octaves. It's mm -hmm. super high, but really, something like this. <laughs> but on top were the gulls. Mm -hmm. And it's a song that has not existed before. In part, I think it's because people are home and they order stuff online and there's so much garbage. And so now there are more gulls and the seagulls are coming to fight over the garbage. Oh my goodness, yeah. So they've added their song to the song of this other bird that want, that's, that's more idyllic, if you will. <laughs> uh, but, Together, they've made quite an interesting piece of music. I have read that your first teachers came in the form of nature, and here was nature kind of bringing me into my day with its particular music, the music of, of these two species of, of birds. And I don't know, I know you're in Switzerland, but I'm wondering how nature is still inside you and inside music since we've not been able to go outside. Ah. Well, it's a very sad moment for all of us humans, so-called humans. Um, but it's also a moment to uh, f suddenly understand that we are part of nature and we can't really um, live like that. We, we, a continuation of this state of, of spirit is killing all of us. And it's it's not just about to protect people with COVID, which I understand very well, It we must do it, but it's also when we think about our mental health, this is just an, an impossible situation. And when you hear a bird outside who is not prohibited to Twitter, I just feel happy for him. And I think that we musicians are also kind of birds and we cannot Twitter. <laughs> and uh, I hope we still can make music because it's our nature and it's, it is not fully killed in us. But the stage, the art, the being together with other people, the togetherness in, in a concert hall is a part of a nature of, of, of a human being. It, it is um, our very much... Um, need it's it's a real basic need to exchange ideas inspire each other react to things we hear and suddenly start to understand in a concert i i miss it very much and i feel like in a jail how have you been been able to maintain or keep your spirit or did you are you are you playing are you practicing what are you what are you doing you can 
um, find um, anything around you and make kind of small art out of it. Even if you are a cleaning lady, it, it can also be a piece of art what you do, if you love what you do. So also being in a house, uh, one can always uh, get the inspiration from, from something. Everything surrounding us is for me a um, vibra vibration or it's 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 music um i started to compose again after a long time I, I was a long period in my life just traveling kind of robot keeping saying yourself that but did uh, you feel like that really that you were a robot yeah um especially when i repeat the same program i i i feel um I need to inspire myself in a kind of crazy way. Um, <laughs> millions of times playing the same piece, you, 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 you need to rethink it, recreate. And then I ask, I'm, I ask myself, why? Why do I do it? Actually, I could play every time a new piece composed by a composer. I could call and uh, talk with, um, work with. And this would be such a bigger contribution to, to our time and to, to our listeners. But we don't have this kind of large agreement about what is actually art. At certain point, you have to start to, to, to think about what, what is actually the real necessity mm. of now. And I think it is very much confronting our classical music audience with uh, something that they have forgotten. If you imagine a scientist would tell you every time the same thing, you wouldn't call him anymore a scientist, no? He would become probably an archivar or a, a museum uh, something or, or a teacher, but not an, an scientist. He needs the freedom to create new questions, new experiments. He has also to have the freedom to, to make mistakes. And this is what we are absolutely um, forbidden even to think about it, to fail on stage. Mm -hmm. We are expecting artists to be like gods. So we, we cannot talk with people because we are on, on different levels, like in a church. So we need very curious audience, daring audience. We need to... Um, to give them every time new food, they they should come hungry and not wanting every time the same schnitzel in the concert. Um, we have to create an environment of um, generosity about the perfection. We don't need uh, CDs in a concert. We have CDs at home. But I don't want people to drink beer and listen to music of Shostakovich or Galina Ostvolska. I want them really to, to feel the pain. I want them to reopen their um, imagination, to go further, deeper, to dig in their souls, to go into chambers which they closed forever when they became adults and needed to go through their everyday life. We can But Patricia, the, the person who must run the concert hall is going to come to you and say to you, I need this and this and this, because the people who can afford, right, to pay you, to keep the lights on, to to do all of these things, uh must must be paid. We must we must generate enough so that we can continue, so that you can, uh, we can support other composers or living composers. Is there not some, and does there not have to be something in the middle? I'm not, I don't disagree with you. But I'm repeating back to you the arguments against this that I hear all the time. Um, you know, in Baroque time, 
um, if a theater did not deliver um, 10 or 20 new works, it was bankrupt. It was exactly the opposite. That was then. That's not true now. That was then. Now That's they true. want the same thing every season. Yes, yes. We should not serve to, to that. We should try to uh, to turn. But you're missing. You're skipping the part that is that is practical. I understand the the idealism. But I'm I'm talking about the the very very practical thing of someone saying to you, yes, I agree, but how do I turn the lights on? We don't yet have an audience, a paying audience, a subscribing audience who is willing to listen to you play new music. Um, it's not true or not everywhere. Um, it is a long-term work by the and commitment and commitment and a true love to new music it's a big difference when people play it just to have a good image um and people who really and truly love and want to to be a part of the history i don't want to be a part of um of um something what smells of old wardrobe i don't want to open it these are costumes of something I don't want to be a, a part of. I um, I want to bring new audience into the concert hall, young people. Um, for instance, it was a very interesting talk with my daughter who told me why she doesn't want to go into a classical concert. She said, you represent a, a world, I, I don't feel touched by this world you are wow. kind of you pretend to be an elite you don't move on stage it's kind of a ritual we don't understand you you, you are faceless you don't make a commitment about or you, you you don't tell us your political opinion we don't know very much about you classical people uh, <laughs> yes it was very interesting uh, because they uh, all these kids they don't they know everything about uh, pop stars, they they um, tell much more about their private life also in, in Twitter and Instagram and all, all that kind of social media. And we should not be too distant from that because this is the time and you 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 make it clear what is now. If I tell you about Commedia dell'arte of 15th and 16th century, um, we could really make an example of that. Um, uh, these were artists who developed a story on spot and that's why the audience was curious and they wanted to know so what is now will Colombini marry like Arlecchino or Pierrot we don't know and even she she didn't know on stage can you imagine that mm -hmm. they just knew the order of the actors and these were figures which they lived with this figure all their life. Colombini was always Colombini. Dottore was always a Dottore. But they invented the story every time in a new way so they could keep the interest of the audience. And what now happened is exactly the opposite. People don't want to be surprised. Or if you take Ballet Russe in Paris, Diaghilev, he said his most important phrase was étonnez moi It means astonish me. So it's it's a we want to know what it's about before we go. Exactly. Otherwise we don't go. Because it's a pro product we want to pay for something we know right. it's good. And um we we need to rethink very much. Also also my daughter told me you these orchestras they dress like servants 100 years ago. It's very interesting because we don't look like normal people of today. So young people don't feel attached to us. We are like teachers talking them to what is right and what is wrong on stage. And we don't speak with them. In America, you do it more often. But in Europe, it's really uncommon to to speak with the audience from, from, from the stage. So the atmosphere is, is very uh, dry and uh, un. Un, um, uncommunicative. She says we, we, we should we should be much more free, dress normally. And I was listening to her, and, and I really must give her the, the the right 
because she is the future. The new generation is the future. They they go on the street and they demonstrate for changing things for because of the climate change. These are very important. This is a very important generation. And classical musicians should not be, um, in in their opinion, a part of, of this um, conservative, un, unflexible old people. I, I don't want that. I, I don't like this um, to be in a dead street. Children without any background of classical music are completely lost in a classical concert. They cannot move, they cannot react somehow. Only that is accepted in the end. They don't know us. I think we should be much more accessible, open to the situation, also being free and open in our mind to change things from time to time. Even the concert order. <laughs> I, I have a small example when I, I really did it. I, I don't know why I did it, actually. I, I was too tired, I think, and I, I thought it's it's ridiculous to, to do again and again the same. In Amsterdam, in the small hall, I had to play um, Tigano Fravel for the thousand and hundred and twenty fifth time and so i decided to ask the audience what kind of tigan would you like to hear to listen tonight and you know um dutch people are very open they immediately um uh, participated in this game so they voted i gave them some possibilities a tigan a la picasso or a tigan a la kandinsky or tigan a la um, Mark Chagall, for example, you know, this flying yeah. uh, violinist, yeah. And they voted, and the majority voted for Chagall. And so then I had the, the problem to play Tigan in style of Chagall. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> what it was very, really thrilling to involve the audience right. in their way of interpretation. It was a completely new experience. We all were listening to what happens now and they all imagined some somehow something i don't know what everybody imagined but uh, you also never know what they hear you know the music it's a long journey first there is an inspiration of a composer in a certain time he hears a piece he imagines something and then he writes it down what is written on paper, it is still a compromise because you cannot write everything on, on paper. It depends very much on your time, on the possibility of expressing everything what you hear. And uh, then it comes through this paper to the um, musician who plays in the concert, which always will be a kind of translation because nobody knows exactly what the composer imagined. And sometimes even the composer doesn't know. Right. It's like a baby you send into the world and it develops by uh, touching other situations, being uh, influenced by other opinions, other people, seeing other things. And what you get back home is, um, is a personality you, you didn't expect. So the same is with a musical piece, um, going through times it becomes every time a new face, it tells always a new story. Um, it speaks different languages if you want. When I play a Beethoven sonata in Turkey or a Beethoven sonata in Wigmo Hall in London, it's, it's a different thing hmm. because I want to speak to people. In what way is it different? In Turkey, I would play it uh, more accessible, uh, less problematic. I wouldn't look too much into dark corners i would bring more the information which i think i uh, i can i can give them and they will enjoy it and they will um um digest it 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 is a language which we have to ad adapt to the place we are when i when i feel the uh very prosperous, fruitful soil that I can plant a new plant in this garden, then I do it. I dare to do it. And then I um, re I um, focus on provoking, 
on um, giving them something new so they um, they listen in a, in a new way. I don't want them to sleep away. I try to take them with with me into a more risky journey on other planets. are you in your family that made you this way <laughs> just me i would say they they know me well and they my my mom says that if if she wants to keep me happy she gives me something to do so i i always move so this is when you were little yeah yeah my motor works when when i have things to do when it's still i'm suffering a lot hmm. and so you say this but also in the context of someone whose life has had to stop for the last year and you're saying that you're enjoying that but you're also saying you're a person whose motor needs to run so which is it we have to reinvent um us in every single situation adjust i am an immigrant i'm a refugee i will survive in any situation i, I hope so and i think in to see the positive sides of anything it's the only solution to survive it to improvise with whatever we have here you know also in auschwitz people made music sure yeah, there was, there was slaves uh, made music. Yes, made music, and also we prisoners of COVID, people of culture. We have to to do what we can. And and what if we can't do anything? What if we feel too discouraged? Too. I know lots of people who have not been able to do anything during this time. They feel very, very beaten down, very, uh, you know, they lose the jobs, they lose the money, they are housing insecure, they are food insecure, and then, and then what? I was thinking about these people all the time. And we had here some um, actions to um, collect money for them to, to right, share. Right, but I'm with... asking you personally, not what not what happened there. I'm mm. I'm saying, what is it that you say to this musician? Do what you can. Do not despair. Find a way and get out of the of this mental jail. If you're an artist, you will find a way how to make your despair and pain 
um, how to make out of it a prosperous something. Do not stop to to um, to reinvent yourself and adjust to the situation. Mm, there is no space for for crying. There are. There are other situations where, where people are even... Yeah, it's, it, it also helps to, to compare your situation with other people. No, it does not. Because it's your, you, don't, you don't have the space to compare yourself to someone. It's you. It's your pain, your despair, your, your inability to be inspired. So it's not enough to just say, well, someone has it worse, and so I shouldn't mm -hmm. feel badly. It is not. It is, it's, it's not. Or do you think that's an American thing? Do you think, I don't know what you think. Tell me what you think. But I, I can tell you that at some point, you have to deal with the fact that you don't want to get out of bed or that you don't know what to do next. You don't know how to be inspired. That's a that's a real thing. And it isn't just someone coming from the outside and telling you, well, don't be that way. Yeah. yeah. I understand because in the first lockdown, I I was in this situation. I, I got um, quite a depression and nothing helped me until I decided to escape physically. So I kind of ran away and got myself on a train and went to Austria, to the city where my sister um, met me on, on a train station, in the train station. So what were you, what, what was it that you were depressed about? What, what made it so that, so because I'm listening to you and you're a person who's saying you must do this and you must pull yourself together and you look around and everything around you is art, everything around you can be inspiration. So what happened to you? I, I was blocked. It, it, it was not anymore possible for me to to find a solution. And and I and every day got worse and worse. And and I I just became um, I was not able to to do anything with it. And so the. So you know what this is. Yes, I know. Of course, I know. That's why I I'm very thankful that I I've been there. I know how dark it is. So I don't want to get ever again there because th there is no escape from there. I should never again open that door. It's it's. But that's not life, Patricia. Some something else may happen, and and you may get there again. Do you not give yourself permission to be there, and you just say, "Well, no, I'm not going to be like this." I don't. I don't think that that is realistic. Well, Maybe it is for you. Then... The, the, the whole life is an illusion. Um, I, I would, I think now I would feel when, when is the danger that I'm on the way to that place, and I, I wouldn't go there because I, I don't want it, and I don't, I, it's, there is no solution. But you think you have control over that? I hope so. I, I had now the second time in the lockdown. I, I, I knew that I have to create kind of illusion of um, of a structure in um, in in a day I, I i started to do yoga every day in the morning and it's not always possible but i i try go out on streets have a fresh air if something happens again um, talk with people call them and keep myself doing something even if it's a nonsense and also just smile to the sunlight and um, dream when, when you see the moon. But um, I don't like to be, a, um, how to say, op opfat, um, um, pessimistic. Pessimistic, I, yeah. I, I, I need, um, I, um, there, there is no place for me there. 
Or, or I, 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 I would I would start to to write very I actually I started to write very dark poems <laughs> and I, I want to compose music for that and it it has to all turn to 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 something that can can be can can help. There's this book. It's called Free Play. Mm -hmm. Improvisation in Life and Art, and it's by a person who's called Stephen Nachmanovich. I may be butchering his name, but there we have it. And here's what he says about the violin. I love this, and I'm curious to know, just to hear a response from you about it. The violin is a ruthlessly honest seismograph of the heart. Four strings stretched over the bridge put 65 pounds of pressure on the wooden sounding chamber. This stored energy amplifies every nuance of weight, balance, friction, and muscle tone as the musician draws the bow over the string. Each tremor and movement reflects the musician's minutest unconscious impulse. There is nothing hidden with the violin. It is like mathematics in that respect. Pretense is impossible. The sound coming out of that instrument is a sensitive lie detector, a sensitive truth detector. Do you have this experience of your instrument? Well, not only violin. I think every uh, instrument is a uh, lying detector. <laughs> <laughs> For every, sure. <laughs> the kind of making art, um, you, you one cannot lie in art. I think it's it's immediately clear that someone learned something to do, and it, it doesn't really touch. But the violin for me is not only that, it's so much more. You are so close to the nerve of the language of, of your heart and, and your roots somehow. You see, my parents, for example, they play folk music and they have since many, many years no concerts at all because they are so uncapable to somehow get into this business. And... Uh, the lockdown is for them kind of normal thing. But you know, they practice every day. They have mm. three hours, <laughs> they rehearse. It's like they, they go to the to, to a job. And my mom said, I, I can't imagine my life without that. And I have to cry through the violin. I have to laugh to make jokes with the violin. I speak with the violin. I remember her very, very well when I was a teenager, she had kind of depression. She played every day violin just for herself. It was kind of therapy. Mm. That's why I, I don't want you to think that I'm the lucky one who has the concerts and don't understand other musicians. I understand them very well, and I'm very much afraid myself of getting jobless, and I know how it is by uh, looking at my parents, for example, and the, when they played in the restaurant when we just immigrated from Moldova to Vienna. I remember my mom coming home and she told me, you know, today two people listened to me. Mm. And now being in my 44 years and being able to, 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 to be on stage and to get the attention of 2,000 people for two hours long, that's, I really, really appreciate it. And mm. I want to use this time to say something what is important to me. And I'm trained to do that. I'm the bird which has to fly and twitter and to find a new re repertory <laughs> every time in every, every spring in every country. I'm just smiling at you, Patricia. That's all. <laughs> just smiling at you. So also, the silence is, is very strong music, very loud music. 
Um, I, I would like to play my last concert whenever it is. I'm, I'm ready to die every moment, but it should be completely silent. I want to share this silence with the audience. <laughs> 